Greetings, colleagues. Greetings and welcome back. As many of you know, I see philosophy as a supremely practical activity. I like to use this phrase. Philosophy should be to the soul what medicine is to the body. For me, this is the primary, the defining feature of uh, the entire philosophical project, the way I see it. And what I wanted to do today is to explore this notion a bit further. Now, I've done many videos on the channel about this practical aspect of philosophy. And uh, specifically, there are two videos which I recorded um, in September in Istanbul. Um, and they were um, philosophy as practice or philosophy as therapy. And uh, also my, my video on meditation. And the immediate starting point for me today is to try to expand on some of the topics that I've touched upon in those two videos. There are a lot of things I want to say, but let me start somewhere and um, I hope I'll be able to get my main points across. I talk about philosophy as being therapeutic, but incidentally, teaching philosophy or you know, talking about philosophy, saying your thoughts out loud, uh, trying to express your thoughts in an orderly manner, trying to explain them to another person. This is also very much part of the philosophical enterprise. So <laughs> immediately, thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you, for, um, thank you for your company on this journey. Hopefully, we'll get somewhere interesting and um, explore something worthwhile along the way. Okay, so where do we begin? Well, might as well start at the very beginning. But where is the beginning? Well, as you know, I like to use this Heideggerian phrase. We always already find ourselves thrown into this world. We find ourselves in this precarious condition where our existence is always necessarily an issue for us. We care about our existence. And we cannot really choose not to care about it. The Buddhists might use the term dukkha, sometimes loosely translated as suffering, to characterize our existence. Which doesn't necessarily mean that existence is horrible or unbearable, but there's a certain essential and crucial element of, um, let's say, unsatisfactoriness about the way things are. In basic psychological terms, we are driven, we have drives. I mean, I wake up in the morning and for all sorts of reasons, biological, physiological, cultural, psychological, I cannot just decide to stay in bed. Or I mean, I could, but it would actually take quite a lot of effort. As Hobbes says, life itself is but motion and can never be without desire. Now, of course, to simply talk about desire, especially in the singular, is far too simplistic. We have many different desires, as well as hopes and fears and values and beliefs. We have habits of the mind, psychological compulsions, unconscious triggers, coping mechanisms. Which is to say there is complexity, in fact, enormous complexity to human psychological life. And this complicated and convoluted system, which is human psyche, can be sliced in various ways can be looked at from various different angles. One way, and admittedly just one of the many ways, yes, that I would propose today is to maybe separate out three different levels. So on the first level, there's existence. There's unreflective, maybe even to some extent unconscious existence. Starting from the very basic and indeed largely uncontrollable functions of the body like breathing or digestion. Digestion is almost entirely beyond our conscious control. Uh, breathing most of the time just happens automatically, but of course one could stop and breathe deliberately. But in fact, we very rarely do try to exercise, you know, conscious control over, you know, over, let's say breathing. This is a very important insight from, let's say somebody like Heidegger that um, in fact, most of the time, most of the things that we do, most of the even maybe decisions that we make throughout our lives are just as uncontrollable, uncontrolled, and just as unconscious as our breathing. Like, let's say, getting from one part of the city to another, 
by foot or maybe driving, right? And at the same time, talking to a friend, right? So many of the things we just do automatically, like going when the light is green or stopping at the red light, etc. In fact, and to some extent, I think that it's a really scary bit, is how much of our thoughts and of our speech is actually unconscious and uncontrolled, you know, in this way. Again, I like this phrase that to a large extent, we do not speak a language, the language speaks through us. And so many of the dialogues that we engage in are in some sense completely automatic and automatic and predictable. So anyway, I meant to talk about the three levels. So this kind of first basic level would be unreflective and to a large extent, maybe even unconscious and uncontrolled. The second level above that would be um, some form of thought in a sense that I don't just act, but I describe my action in a certain way. Like maybe let's say I have a certain value or I have a certain goal and I try to deliberately reshape or redirect my actions. Like, you know, take, take conscious control, conscious control over my actions and direct it to a certain goal, a certain aim. You could talk, I guess, about instrumental rationality on this level. And then above that, there would be a third level. And this would be thinking about thinking. This would be, I guess, reflection. So uh, uh, when we don't just um, act on our values, but maybe we try to step back and we try to re-examine our values. We don't just try to achieve our goals, but we try to ask ourselves the question of, you know, why do we have the goals that we have? And are the goals that we have, are they, are they actually good? As Nietzsche would put it, to ask the question of what is the value of values themselves. Of course, one could also phrase this in terms of the proverbial philosophical question of what is the meaning of life? And on this question of the meaning of life, or if you want, the question of values with a capital V, there is this striking, startling disconnect. A disconnect, a paradox, maybe even a contradiction. The disconnect between, so to speak, the traditional way of life and the philosophical vision of life. And when I say traditional life, I mean this very broadly, like what we can glean from uh, history or historical anthropology, the way that I guess most human beings have lived throughout the, you know, throughout the history of existence of human beings as such present day, as well as in ancient times, as well as in prehistoric hunter-gathering times, right? There's a, I think that there's a certain picture that we can be more or less confident in. The basic picture that, you know, when human children are born, they are socialized into a society, some form of society, be it a small hunter-gathering tribe of, you know, 50 individuals or something like that, or, or, or be it a modern post-industrial society. Obviously, these two societies would be very different, but there's nevertheless, a certain common element. And this common element is that, again, we take things for granted. And to some extent, I think it's biological, if you want, like genetically pre-programmed, and to some extent it's cultural, so culturally pre-programmed, if you want. We take certain things for granted in a sense that we take, we take it for granted that there are certain, you know, answers to the basic riddle of life. There are certain answers to the question of value, what is good, or what should I do with my life? Well, these values, these habits, these, you know, taken for granted, unreflective prejudice could be very, very different from place to place or from you know, one time to another time. Still, from within the culture, they look real. Like in all times and in all places, you know, to the best of our knowledge, um, within a human culture, um, there are characteristic of a human culture, yes, there are hierarchies of values and automatic judgments, certain particular taboos, things that one should never say or never do. And of course, I, I was talking about a disconnect, a chasm, in fact, maybe even like a contradiction. The contradiction is between this automatic, uh, very, very self-assured, um, tendency of culture to enshrine its order of value, its hierarchy of value on the one hand, and the philosophical skepticism and the philosophical uncertainty on the other hand.
yes, cultures have their values, have their taboos, but can cultures really prove apodictically the value of those values, the, the kind of the certitude, the truth of those um, taboos? Again, since ancient times, somebody like Socrates, Socrates would be inclined to say that, you know, he is wise who, like Socrates, knows that human mind is radically limited, that the only thing that we can really, really, really know for certain uh, um, is basically nothing, that we can know nothing for certain, which is, by the way, in and of itself, probably best not thought of as a kind of serious assertion, because the idea is not to assert something positive, that, you know, I know this as a statement, I know that I know nothing, but no, rather than I see a limitation, a fallibility of my own mind. And therefore, it's not that I come to certain particular, you know, like religiously held conclusions, it's that I refrain from making any definitive conclusions, which, you know, I could believe or accept to be true for all times and in all places. The human mind is limited, the human senses are limited, we can be mistaken, we can lie, we can lie to ourselves, we can lie to others, etc., etc. And therefore, any kind of truth with a capital T is never available to us. And by extension, values with a capital V can also never really be available to us. In fact, if anything, and that's a topic for another day, it seems that the more we study and the more we understand the universe, limited our understanding though might be, still, to the extent that we hypothetically and provisionally believe that we understand something about the universe, it appears that the universe is, <laughs> in the words of Immanuel Kant, the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter, the schlund des zwecklosen chaos der materie. It appears this way. And so, to cut the potentially very long story short, I think that there is a kind of robust, ne albeit negative conclusion, philosophical conclusion, axiological conclusion, if you want, conclusion about the, uh, <laughs> the nature of values. The conclusion that values with a capital V or meaning of life with a capital M do not seem to be accessible to us and maybe they don't even exist. So instead of pursuing these kind of apodictic capital V values, the only thing that we can really do is to try to make life slightly more palatable. In the words of Freud, <laughs> replace neurotic misery with ordinary human unhappiness. This is a sentiment that we especially find in modern Western philosophy, starting with the scientific revolution with people, you know, such as, let's say, Thomas Hobbes or very famously Friedrich Nietzsche after Hobbes. But we don't have to look at modern Western philosophy. I think a similar sentiment, in fact, maybe even an identical sentiment, can be found uh, in the works of the ancients, in people such as Epicurus or Democritus, in people such as Sextus Empiricus, or in the Eastern traditions, in the works of, you know, Lao Tzu, or the Buddha. And here I think a very important and a very legitimate question to ask is, okay, so if we don't seem to have an unproblematic access to any kind of account of values with a capital V, does that imply that human life is completely meaningless and literally anything goes? Well, <laughs> let me tell you, I don't really think so. And in fact, I think that the very question itself is misguided in a very important respect. Asking the question in this way, I think, overestimates the importance of human individual choice and the quote-unquote freedom of this individual choice. We find ourselves thrown into this world. We find ourselves already with beliefs, desires, dispositions. We find ourselves as part of nature, as part of society. There's all sorts of biological and cultural baggage that cannot be just discarded or bracketed out. And in fact, in an important respect, again, when I wake up in the morning, it doesn't matter what I think, it doesn't matter what I decide is the meaning of my life. Again, there are these automatic functions of my body that will steer me, you know, one way or another. Let's say I wake up in a particularly depressive mood, but still, the body at some point takes over. The body is thirsty. The body is hungry, right? It's very hard to break it out, the urges of the body. And 
likewise, um, in terms of society, it's hard, very hard, in fact, to break it out, the impact that society and culture has on us. I mean, to the extent that we are successfully socialized, we have a certain image of ourselves, a certain value-laden description of ourselves. We have a certain image of what it means to have a good life or a bad life. And this kind of an image is, I would say, just as difficult to break it out as it is difficult to break it out the urges of the body. So there's a further important point I want to take up is that if the universe indeed, indeed is the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter, we could ask this question, um, what is value? Yes. And more importantly, um, why should the values be pro-social? And that, I think, is a somewhat dangerous but also a very important question. There seems to be a general presupposition in, you know, in axiology, in ethics, that, you know, if something is good, it's good for everyone. And I think, in principle, it's possible to imagine some kind of an ethic which would be kind of radically anti-social. Uh, but here, again, I think in a certain preliminary fashion, the answer is quite clear. Um, human nature is itself social. Human children are not viable on their own. Human children don't survive unless, at the very least, their parents or some immediate family or somebody takes care of them. And likewise, it seems that um, for evolutionary reasons, like evolutionary biological reasons, but also, you know, for cultural evolutionary reasons, it seems that human beings can only successfully thrive in a community of other human beings. I mean, you could think of some particular exceptions, um, but I think that at the end of the day, these would be the exceptions that kind of prove the rule anyway. To take some kind of an extreme example of a monk or a hermit, mm -hmm. usually before one becomes a monk, one is educated in, let's say, some kind of a religious tradition that explains what, what it means to be a hermit, what it means to be a monk. And for me, in this respect, a very important example is the example of the Buddha, who, you know, goes into the forest and who meditates, who, you know, lives as a hermit. But once the Buddha achieves enlightenment, well, actually, once the person, Shakyamuni, becomes the Buddha and achieves enlightenment, he comes back. He comes back to the people to share the message. And honestly, I think that it's a non-trivial question, in fact, you know, complicated and interesting question in kind of um, in Buddhist philosophy as to why, you know, if nirvana is supposed to be this completely self-sufficient state of perfect tranquility and calmness and extinguishing of all desires, why does the Buddha come back? Again, as I said, I think it's a complicated, not a trivial question to which the answer is not necessarily obvious, but on some level, on some level, I think it just, it, it seems like a, like a very human thing to do. A very human thing to do in a sense that, you know, once one has achieved wisdom, it only seems natural that one would want to share it with others. And not only share, but also to some extent verify. Actually, the very concept of sharing, when we apply it to something intangible, I mean, Wisdom is not like an apple. It doesn't get diminished when you share it. In fact, on the contrary, maybe paradoxically, you know, one derives, I think, a deep satisfaction from sharing wisdom. But also, again, in this uh, general case, <laughs> whether it applies to Buddha or not is a, <laughs> is a separate question. But in the general case, to the extent that we think that human mind is limited and we can never really get the hold of complete truth with a capital T. To that extent, by sharing um, our hypotheses with others, we have a chance to improve them, correct them, you know, identify further problems or applications. In fact, I would say even to understand one's own thoughts, one needs to make them public. One needs to say them out loud or write them on a piece of paper. This, I think, very clearly demonstrates the, you know, the social nature of human existence and, you know, provides some kind of a tentative argument as to why, you know, values tend to be pro-social, or some kind of preliminary argument why 
true values, <laughs> whatever that word means, should be pro-social. Now, of course, having said that, it's very important to note that <laughs> human interactions tend not to be perfectly harmonious. And even though ideally we hope to live in families, in groups, in cities or in societies that are or tend to be on the harmonious side, in reality, in reality, most interactions are less than perfectly harmonious, less than perfectly consensual, and in fact have you know, quite a bit of an element of conflict in, within them. Again, human psyche is a complicated, convoluted system, and the human psyche, I would say, to some extent is at war with itself, in conflict with itself. And even more so when people interact, these conflictual elements uh, would also almost necessarily be embedded in those interactions as well. So human beings can, can lie, can deceive. Um, human beings can be prone to um, unmindful, spiteful emotions, unwholesome emotions. And I mean, at the end of the day, very often we say things not because we believe that they are true, but because we are motivated by some kind of a passion, because sometimes it just feels nice to say certain things. One notorious example of this is kind of these uh, tribal modules, these tribal ways of thinking, where it appears that human beings are, are you know, sometimes motivated to uh, relish in this us versus them rhetoric and, uh, you know, to, to, to vilify or demonize, you know, particular opponents, individuals or groups. And that's a dangerous element of human psyche. I think it, it's safe to say it has very long standing uh, cultural and biological evolutionary orange, origins. And these sorts of tribal emotions tend to be very powerful. People tend to be very passionate about them. And this is, I think, one of the core values of philosophy, to learn to control oneself, to learn to control one's passions, to, to learn to notice these kinds of passions in the first place. So necessarily within the philosophical project, there's a certain struggle with oneself, maybe struggle against oneself, struggle to reshape oneself, to better understand and to better control oneself. A certain kind of struggle and a certain kind of effort to reshape, to change what we are. Again, I believe that philosophy, properly speaking, should be a transformative enterprise. And I keep talking about again, let's say, individual human emotions, but also on the level of society, again, what Durkheim could call sui generis, this, the sui generis level of society, um, kind of society has a logic of its own, you could also have certain kind of structural effects, especially the selection effects, where, let's say, certain ideas get traction, not necessarily because particular individuals are psychologically motivated to, you know, enjoy these ideas or derive some kind of pleasure from saying them, but because, again, there are certain, you know, selective mechanisms, like, uh, let's say, if certain, let's say, religious beliefs aid in group selection, and so you get, I mean, you, you get or you could get a particular, let's say, article of faith, which um, has, you know, ar arisen historically, maybe for completely spurious or like, let's say, random uh, reasons, but this belief or article of faith is then retained because, again, specifically of this kind of group selective dynamic, so much so that theoretically one could imagine that you could have uh, uh, a belief which is dysfunctional on the level of the individual, like makes individual life worse, uh, makes people unhappy, but at the same time makes groups more efficient at um, kind of survival and reproduction, or, or let, let's say I don't know, survival and proliferation of, of a group or of a group value or of a group norm. In the sense in which, let's say, something like the Roman Empire has persisted through time and, you know, expanded into territories and, you know, remade people into, um, or at least to some extent, reshaped particular individuals in the mold of the Roman culture. And I think that's definitely a very important part of philosophy to be on the lookout for those kinds of mechanisms as well. So again, and this is a topic I like to talk about a lot, this philosophy as the art of self-defense. Philosophy as the art of self-defense against 
two opponents. <laughs> One of them is the kind of the psychological quirks of human nature, again, the coping mechanisms, the psychological compulsions, etc. This struggle that takes place, I would say, um, on a psychological level, like we need, you know, as human beings, it seems that, you know, thrown into this world without a manual, we need to study psychology to understand humans better, to understand ourselves better. But also on this kind of second logic, second example of um, structural effects, I would say that one, you know, psychology is not enough. We also need to study sociology or social theory, broadly speaking. And I use social theory here in very broad terms. So social theory, I guess, would include economic theory and political theory within it. And notice, because I frame this in terms of study, like we, we need to study psychology, we need to study social theory. There's again, this <laughs> pro-social aspect, which, which comes into the picture. I mean, human mind is limited. There's not much that a human individual can understand simply by themselves. It seems that in order to gain a deep insight into reality, one needs to work with others. One ideally needs to be a part of a school. And of course, you know, schools and universities have their problems and sometimes can be used to propagate uh, false ideologies. But it seems that the only reliable antidote against false ideologies is again, just, you know, have better schools. And even the question itself of how can you have better schools? What are the conditions? Let's say, what are the material conditions or structural organizational conditions of having a quote unquote good school, right? That's, that's also a question for inquiry. Yes, yes, I'm reminded of Karl Marx's famous quote, who will educate the educators? And I mean, on a certain level, what I'm trying to do here in this talk is just to expand on uh, Socrates' famous phrase that the unexamined life is not worth living. That the proper human excellence, the proper excellence of a human being lies first and foremost in knowledge, in seeking knowledge, in cooperation, in conversation, in dialogues with others. And yet, as Socrates himself already understood, to a very large extent, this is an uphill struggle because human psyche is convoluted, human beings have propensity to make mistakes and to lie, and human societies tend to be conflictual, at least to some extent. So this struggle to know is a collective struggle, but it is a complicated, convoluted, uphill struggle. A difficult and challenging struggle in which you know, the positive outcome is not necessarily guaranteed. But of course, even though the success is not guaranteed, we have to struggle. We cannot, you know, once we have seen the light, once we have woken up, we cannot just go back to sleep. I mean, I would imagine that there could be circumstances that would force one to go back to sleep because one is too exhausted too hungry, too just downtrodden to continue the intellectual quest. This is incidentally a point which is forcefully made by uh, John Stuart Mill, I think actually in his Utilitarianism, where he talks about how, you know, when one is of sound mind and in, you know, full consciousness, full control of one's faculties, one would not willfully choose to become ignorant, to, you know, to go back to sleep. So a struggle to know, a struggle to understand, a struggle, importantly, undertaken together with others, a struggle to overcome the unhelpful, the unenlightened elements of our own nature, but also a struggle to overcome the less than harmonious, the dysfunctional elements of our societies. These are the ultimate stakes of the philosophical enterprise. And for me, it is very important to remind myself of these stakes of what philosophy is about, especially because so much of our culture is now, you know, devoted to um, holy wars and manufactured outrage and, you know, um, conflict and cliques and, um, <laughs> you know, this dysfunctional social media algorithms. Even how quickly, you know, the, the news, the sound bites, the, the slogans, right? Uh, um, given how quickly they proliferate and, uh, you know, because of the 
of the amount of, of the number of people involved, yes, and um, kind of these selective mechanisms, these kinds of, you know, quasi-evolutionary mechanisms um, that, that give rise to more and more, you know, catchy news titles, uh, catchy and clickbaity to take our informational environment as a whole. Of course, we have the algorithms which are specifically designed, um, you know, in, a, in particular ways, but also over and above that, there is a certain unconscious, anonymous logic, sui generis logic of the informational space, which nobody has designed, but, but again, which um, evolves on its own, maybe in some way, follows its own laws of evolution, if you want. And this dynamic informational environment filters through, again, the, the sound bites, the clickbaity titles, which are most effective and efficient at grabbing our attention, at hijacking, honestly, just hijacking, straight out hijacking our brain. And so, of course, I would affirm the timeless value of philosophy since time immemorial, you know, since the ancient uh, times of Buddha or Lao Tzu or Socrates or Heraclitus. But it also seems to me that maybe, again, as human society develops and evolves these faster and faster means of communication, it becomes more and more important to develop, so to speak, the countermeasures. Again, if philosophy is the art of self-defense, it seems that this self-defense has never been in, in more serious demand than it is right now. Not to mention, with the increase of human capacity, with the, with the increase in capacity of humanity as a whole, right? Um, capacity to make individuals happy, to make societies, societies thrive, but also in capacity of humanity to destroy ourselves and to make human beings miserable and to suffer, to spread suffering. Again, as capacity of humanity evolves, at the same time, it becomes more necessary to deploy this philosophy as an art of self-defense. Um, it, it is more needed. It is more lacking, yes. And at the same time, the stakes become higher, right? If we lose control, if we lose this battle of self-defense, the stakes could be um, catastrophic. And as you know, I like to end these talks by my three favorite slogans, uh, which are associated with particular names, but I'm not sure I should, you know, the names are not necessarily important. It's the slogans which are important. Or better yet, it's the ideas behind the slogans. And these ideas are that, um, yes, our mind seems to make us pessimistic, right? I'm giving a picture which is to, to a large extent pessimistic, but, but the will has to stay optimistic in order for us to be able to overcome the challenges. Yes, this is an allusion to Antonio Gramsci's famous phrase, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Although I have to say that lamentably, I, I see that Gramsci appears to, to become more and more controversial philosopher like he, he's becoming more controversial as a, you know, in the, in the public perception, in the public imagination. And uh, I personally, I don't think of Gramsci as particularly controversial. So maybe this is, you know, it, it feels to me to be a kind of a misperception or maybe a misunderstanding of, of what Gramsci was trying to say. So to go back to my three slogans. So even though our intellect gives us reasons to be pessimistic, we have to stay optimistic. Our will needs to be optimistic in order to overcome the challenges. So this is the first thesis. And then the second thesis is that, um, yes, even though our intellect is pessimistic, but at the same time, the challenges are so great that they ultimately, these challenges, they should unite us because they deal with the things in which we have this largely overlapping common interest. We are in this together. And the third thesis is that, yes, precisely because the challenges are so great and they apply to all of us, 
necessarily the solution has to be some form of a free cooperation between individuals. Again, to use another phrase, the free development of each is a condition for the free development of all. And again, the dialogical nature of the intellectual enterprise, of the philosophical enterprise, reinforces that we can only be wise if we share our wisdom. We can only be wise if we stand on the shoulders of people who came before us and who pe of people who work with us, together with us. And so to me, this little talk, this little discussion, this little meditation on the nature of philosophy and, you know, the pro-social nature of philosophy and, and, and the stakes of the philosophical enterprise. This little meditation is very important for me um, as a certain kind of a, a certain kind of a tuning fork or, or maybe a tuning procedure to not necessarily get the per perfect pitch, of course, but to try to, to try to refocus the mind, to try to break it out the unwholesome and the partial, the limited um, emotions, to break it out the petty grudges and the compulsions, and to focus on the big picture, to become at least slightly more aware, slightly more awake. And colleagues, I hope I have been able to impart at least a little bit of this energy to you as well. I definitely hope to continue the dialogue, because indeed there's a lot of work to be done. And until next time, stay safe and take care.